I'm excited to be here. Glad to see the new people that, that have joined us for this session. This is going to be a very different session, as you can already kind of see by my James Bond theme of my, my slide deck here. Um, but before we get into the session, I'd just like to take a moment to introduce myself. For those who weren't in the last session, my name is Marcus Zegger. I'm the president and chief software architect of a company called uh, EPS, uh, better known under our code brand called Encode Magazine. And what I do is I spend a a lot of time writing code, even though I'm the owner of the company, I spend about 90% of my time writing code and working with customers and doing lots of interesting stuff, uh, also internal, because we own several companies like Code Magazine, and this will become very important for this particular session here. Um, I also spend a lot of time doing presentations. I'm bumming I couldn't come to Mauritius in person would have been very, very cool. Uh, I am currently in Europe, which is where I'm originally from, but I am uh, but I live in Hawaii. Uh, so it would have been kind of an island to island cooperation. It should have been a lot of fun, but hopefully in the future. Um, anyway, a little bit about my organization. So what we do, and this is important for this particular presentation here, is our main thing is we build custom software, we do consulting, we do things like training, we publish a magazine, uh, we own a few other companies, uh, we host code for our customers. So we have things like um, uh, a digital escrow company that we host the data for, we do DNA analysis and, and just a number of businesses like that. And that, uh, as you'll see, is gonna be very interesting for this particular session. Um, so a combination of hosting our own stuff, doing things for other people is, is what our business is. And in that we run very large infrastructure, which again will be important for this particular presentation uh, and uh, all the things that can go wrong with that. One other thing before I get started here, uh, I already did this in my last session, I'm going to do it here again. Uh, if you're in the session, uh, I invite you to get a free Digital Co. Magazine subscription under this URL. It's our standard URL slash VDC 2020, Virtual Developers Conference 2020. So you can get a free subscription, no strings attached, not trying to sell you anything, just a free goodie you can get. But with that, we have a lot to talk about. And this is going to be a, a very different session. Uh, for most of you who have seen anything I've either done as a session or something that I've written about, those are usually very much how-to sessions. Today, I'm going to tell you a story. And in a way, it's a very exciting story because it's a story of uh, crime, disaster, and recovery. From my point of view, the excitement wasn't that great, uh, especially when we had to live through it. But uh, in hindsight, it was an interesting experience and an experience that I that I feel we've mastered pretty good, uh, an experience that we mastered without anything embarrassing happening, which is why we are among the few that are willing to talk about what happened here. Um, so what, what are we talking about here? Well, in a way, we're talking about a Christmas story of some Christmas story. Because what happened essentially is this. This was about the middle of December of 2019. Uh, I think it was December 14th. And it had been a tough year, or not a tough year, but it had been a busy year. Uh, we've done a lot of things as a company in 2019. We've created new office space. We've hired a lot of people. Uh, we started a partnership uh, with Microsoft with our magazine, which grew the magazine drastically. Um, implemented new technologies. We started new areas of uh, expertise where we do consulting in. So it, it was a huge year for us. Uh, we just had our internal developer conference in November and, and everybody was super thrilled, but also frankly a little tired. And that day, December 14th, ironically, I had traveled to Houston, which is where our headquarter is, away from my home in Hawaii. And I had a lot of customer meetings. 
meetings for two or three days. And this was my last customer meeting of the year. It was a, an afternoon and a big dinner with uh, the board members of a very large organization that we had been doing business with for, for years and years. And I came back from this dinner after midnight. I was exhausted, but I was also happy because it was a good year coming to an end. And I was about to head into what I thought was going to be uh, my year end breather, my Christmas retreat, going back to Europe. And so I got to my hotel room in Houston and I had a notification on my mobile phone, which said some of our servers were down. And those servers are servers that existed in our own on-premise data center. And I thought, okay, we may have a, a problem with the uh, service provider. Perhaps our internet connection went out and it's failing over to some other, to some back, to, to a backup service that we use. And I figured, well, you know, this happens and, and my guys, I'm sure, already got the notification and they have it under control and tomorrow morning everything will be fine. And so I went to sleep, expecting anything particularly awful was going to happen. And I got up the next morning and my phone had literally hundreds of notifications of parts of our system that had gone down. Uh, anything from web servers to databases to you name had, by the looks of it, just disappeared. And, and that, in fact, was pretty much what happened. So I got up, uh, I called some people, uh, they were all in shambles. I I went to the office uh, in our headquarter in Houston as quickly as I could. And nobody really knew what was going on, except we knew our infrastructure was just all down. It, it appeared to have just completely disappeared. And we started to, to dig around. Uh, it kind of dawned on us that this was not a natural occurrence. But it was very, very difficult to see what was actually going on because as we went into the office, literally none of our computers were working. None of the servers, none of the laptops, uh, the Wi-Fi wasn't working. We couldn't get into our Linux machines. We couldn't get into our Windows machines. You name it. Everything we had was non-functional. And so we didn't even know what the nature of the problem might be because we couldn't log in with any maintenance systems. Uh, we could just do nothing. And so it took us about two or three hours until we finally managed to get uh, a laptop back up and running. And on that laptop, which didn't boot up anymore, but at least we could turn it on. And we got to a point where we could, with a USB stick, boot this thing up enough to look at the hard drive on them. And at that point, it became clear that we had become the, the victims of a ransomware attack. In other words, we saw one file that was accessible on that entire hard drive. This was the first file that we've been able to access all day, and that file was a ransomware notice. In other words, hey, we've attacked you, all your systems are compromised, and unless you pay us this much money, you will never be able to run any of your systems again. So that is how my well-deserved Christmas break 2019 started. And as you can imagine, this was not much of a break. This was initially weeks of work trying to recover a lot of the things. Um, and it uh, eventually turned into months of work. And to this day, we are not 100% operational. And, and that's essentially the story that I'm going to tell you today, my Christmas story of 2019. So what had happened exactly? Well, it was extremely difficult to ascertain what had really happened. Uh, in fact, we did forensic analysis after the fact. Uh, we had several companies helping us with that, as you can imagine. We are a company that has expertise in this ourselves, and so, so we use that. But but it was really difficult what had happened because one of the things I was pretty sure about, and that was that it wasn't just something stupid we did. You know, you hear about these ransomware attacks or other virus attacks, and uh, you immediately think, okay, somebody opened a stupid email, somebody went to a website they shouldn't have gone to, they downloaded some app and installed it as admin or anything like that. 
But that's not the kind of company we are. We have staff that is almost 100% technical. So they are not easily fooled. Uh, so it never made much sense to me that somebody would have just opened an email attachment or, or that such an email attachment would have even gone through our systems undetected. And in fact, today, after we had uh, a lot of time to analyze what happened, and I'll talk about some of those details a little later, but today I can say it wasn't that. Uh, it wasn't that somebody did anything stupid. It wasn't that we had big security holes. It wasn't that we did things with our infrastructure that we shouldn't have done. But it simply was an attack that was a sophisticated attack that was, success, that, that was successful to some extent. Uh, now, had we done anything stupid, as is the case in many such scenarios, I probably wouldn't sit here today telling you about this because it would be too embarrassing. But in this case, I really feel we did just about everything we could have done. Nothing stupid was done. And it, it was an attack that we had to fight off but we fought the fight well and we recovered from it, but it was very, very difficult, very costly and very, very time consuming. And before this happened, of course, I was aware of all the different things that could happen. And we had done some threat analysis before, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we have security reviews of our systems periodically. And so you think of this as something that could theoretically happen, but you feel, oh, it's not going to happen to me. Uh, we, we, you know, we are not doing anything stupid. We, we are on top of this, and, and they're going to get everyone else first. Well, the reality is, with these types of ransomware attacks, they're not singling people out typically. It's just automated systems that scan the entire internet essentially for vulnerabilities, and if they find one, uh, they're going to hit you. So this can happen to anyone. And it does, in fact, happen to a lot of people. Uh, there's more and more reports of these types of attacks. And they happen to the largest organizations. They happen to government organizations. They happen to hospitals, uh, which I find particularly distasteful, that hospitals would be hit with something like this and then potentially life-preserving machines would not work anymore. So this is a widespread problem. It's just most people, I guess, are... Uh, too embarrassed to talk about it, which is why we decided specifically to publicize what happened to us. So what was the initial damage? Uh, well, there was a number of things that went wrong. I have a, a screenshot here of essentially the only thing that we could see on, on that one machine that we got up and running. Uh, you will get a ransomware notice that basically says all your files are encrypted contact this or that email and we'll uh, sell you a decryption key. And different ransomwares do this differently. In our case, it was one uh, called Medusa Locker. And Medusa Locker flies a little bit under the radar, which is why it's so successful. And they, when you contact them, will individually investigate you and say, oh, you're this or that larger company will charge you uh, this or that much. And uh, they are known to actually decrypt your files when you do pay. We did not pay, I wanna say that right up front. Um, and these are often, uh, and that was a little bit of a surprise to me, these are often very large operations. Like some of these uh, attackers, some of these cyber criminals will have entire call centers that they hire in case you have trouble decrypting your files when you, when you get the decryption key, uh, just so they can have a reputation of really decrypting your files. Now others will not be so kind. Others will uh, will want your money and you'll send them your money and you never even get a decryption key or, or maybe the decryption key doesn't work or the email list that may be gone by the time you try to contact them. So it's, it's a rather nasty thing and you have a real problem. So what are the problems? What is the initial damage report that we got? Uh, well, the initial thing that happened was 100% of our servers, desktop, laptops, everything we had on that local network in our headquarters was entirely encrypted. So that means you don't have your physical servers working anymore. You don't have any virtual servers working anymore. You don't have any laptops working anymore. And everybody who attaches to that network will have the same problem. We literally had not a single machine 
at our headquarters that was unaffected. And at our headquarters, we have offices for people. So there were a number of employees that were there. So their desktops, their laptops were all fully encrypted. But more importantly, we used to run a sizable on-premise data center that hosted most of our public facing as well as internal infrastructure, both for our own businesses, such as Code Magazine, as well as for, for some of our customers, such as the DNA business that we host and so on. Now, some of it, some of our infrastructure was on the cloud because we were in a process of moving more and more to the cloud, uh, but some of our beefier systems had not been moved yet. And so they were all affected. The cloud machines were not affected as such, but every single one of our machines, virtual or physical, were simply gone, uh, as you can I mean, they were still there physically, but you couldn't do anything with them. So they were entirely encrypted. Okay. Not a single piece of hardware was unaffected. Um, now, one of the things that was really worrisome was it was initially unclear on whether this may have been passed on to customers or, or to people that either came to the office or that we had gone to. Because like I mentioned in the beginning, I had just spent my prior two or three days going on site with various customers to do my year end visits and then planning for the next year and so on. So I was on these people's networks. Now, of course, they run their own security and so on, but it was still a big worry because what a lot of the more sophisticated ransomware does is it infects a system and it then just sits there for a while to go undetected and, and spread itself and then start doing what it does. Uh, so, so that was a big worry. Now, in, in our case, we'd all been running up-to-date virus software and so on. So luckily, this turned out not to be a problem because this, of course, would have been not just incredibly embarrassing, but it would have been certainly drastically damaging to our organization. But luckily, this was not the case. Now, as it goes on here, um, what did all this mean? Well, it meant initially that all our public facing websites were down. So if you went to codemac.com, it's gone. There wasn't even a message we could put up. It was simply gone because the machine was de facto gone. Uh, and we have several other public facing websites and they all had the same problem, just gone. Not even a message that was up and running. So. Uh, that was for all the websites, all the public facing infrastructure that we had, even APIs um, for that matter, were gone because they were mostly now on-premise data center, but it even went a little bit into the cloud, even though our cloud-based systems were up and running, they all depended on, or, or almost all depended on some data that came from our other data centers. So the backend services that these systems used were still at our big data center in Houston, and therefore they were de facto not working either. But at least there we could put up a message that said, hey, you know, we're currently down and, and we'll be back. But for the majority of our sites, it was just, they were simply gone uh, and no ability to put anything up. Um, our internal sites and infrastructures, our back office system, uh, Windows applications that uh, our internal employees or contractors used were down, uh, things that were mobile applications that we used internally, uh, our web apps that we used internally, as well as uh, websites that serve the needs of our employees, all gone, simply disappeared. In fact, we had trouble even communicating with people that were not in our headquarters. And, and most of our employees are off-site, they're distributed, they, they're anywhere from Europe to Australia to North America. Uh, we had some degree of difficulty even communicating with them uh, because they could not log into certain system because things like Active Directory controllers were down, DNS servers were simply gone. Okay, so, so all that infrastructure was just not working. Okay, mail servers were just gone. So as you think this through, you realize the size of your problem that you have when your complete network goes down. We lost databases. Every single database we had was on-premise. A lot of the file storage we had 
for the more important files was on premise. So all our SQL data, uh, all our NoSQL data, all our accounting databases, documents, customer data, the list of people that subscribe to Code Magazine and their subscription history, all completely gone and disappeared. So if you were a Code Magazine subscriber that went online, say between Christmas and New Year of 2019 to access their content, gone. It simply wasn't there anymore. There wasn't for, for a while. There wasn't even a message up telling you what happened because we had no means of doing so. Uh, very interesting was the problem of virtual machines within our data center. We had our physical servers, but all our actual servers were virtual machines. They were not just gone, but they were double encrypted. In other words, the servers, the virtual servers in their file systems, all those files were encrypted. But then the actual virtual machine files, they were encrypted themselves as well. So they were double encrypted. And as it turned out later, it was a real interesting problem because what this particular ransomware does is it goes in and it starts infecting one machine and it then goes out very efficiently. And this is somewhat unique to the Medusa ransomware. It goes out very efficiently and it turns off services and so on to get access to other machines. So it is actually very good at disabling your virus protection and stuff like that. And then it starts to, to go out on the, on the on a network and access every network resource and start encrypting it. But then what can happen and what we believe happened in our case was that you have different instances of this thing with different encryption keys trying to access the same network shares. So you might have one version of Medusa encrypting one file and another encrypting the other. So you may even have cross encryption scenarios where not every file is encrypted with the same key. And then even if you get the decryption key, uh, you really can't decrypt the entire machine and it becomes very, very difficult. So that was an interesting scenario. Now, the other thing that happened was that all our cloud drives, such as OneDrive, such as Dropbox and so on, were encrypted as well. And this meant that those encrypted files were, were, were then starting to replicate very fast and very efficiently to everyone who used all this stuff. So this included all the offsite employees it included things that you had on mobile devices. So if we had something in OneDrive or Dropbox, within no time at all, an employee in Australia may look on their mobile phone in their Dropbox folder and it's all encrypted as well. Okay? So that was something that was very worrisome, although as we'll discuss later, that actually turned out to be not a big problem as such. But that was the damage that we were originally facing. So. In a lot, of, a lot of ways, you can think of this as just uh, everything was gone. You all of a sudden have a company that grew over 20, 25 years with all our infrastructure, with all our history, with all our data gone overnight. Nothing is left. Nothing is working. Okay. Now, a little more about the setup we had at the time. Uh, like I said, we, we ran a mixture of cloud-based and on-premise software. So we were in the process of moving to the cloud, uh, to mainly Azure, a little bit of AWS, but the most difficult things that, that were the most difficult to move, such as some of our very large databases, uh, which were difficult to move because they were large, but also because of their structure. Like there were, some of them were older databases, that had a lot of binary files in them, for instance. So we have a database, for instance, that is for, for the production of our magazine. And it had all the data in there that was needed for that, but it also had binary files stored in SQL Server because years and years ago, that's just the way you did it. And so we have very, very large files in there because a print-ready production version uh, of a file that goes to a print shop to produce a printed magazine. This is a very high res file that's very large. And not only do you have one of those for a magazine, but you probably have 10 of those because you go back and forth for corrections and reviews. <clears throat> and we had that for 20 years uh, worth of magazine. So, you know, that's one example of why some of our stuff was so large and so difficult to move. And that's why we hadn't moved everything 
to the cloud yet. And frankly, there was no reason to move some of this to the cloud because we already had all our infrastructure. We already owned all our servers. So our idea was we'll do, we'll do a gradual move to the cloud. We're not going to replace old servers, but while we have them, why would we move them? And so that was our setup at the time uh, for most of our businesses. Now, from a software development point of view, it was completely different. So as far as our software development efforts go in, in our custom software part of the business and our consulting part of the business, where we work with a lot of customers, we had moved just about everything either to Azure DevOps or GitHub. Okay? So that was very fortunate for us because none of that stuff was affected. Now we had some local versions where uh, GitHub repos locally on the machine were encrypted, but you know we lost nothing as it turned out because it happened overnight and people had pushed to GitHub or, or Azure DevOps and therefore we could just roll back and, and get an unencrypted version. So that was very lucky and it meant that all our employees who had working computers could just clone their repos and be on their way doing more development. Uh, the only thing that was difficult for development was we had some uh, development databases that teams shared uh, that were on-premise, but even most of that we had moved to Azure already at the time. So that was the good news. Not a lot of bad things happened in our development operations and, and, and all those projects could go forward. The only problem with source code was we still had for archive purposes all the things that were in TFS on premise in our data center. And for some stuff that was way old, but we still kept for archive purposes, that was even still in visual source safe. And, and all of that was gone, of course, right? We didn't have uh, any, any access to any of those machines anymore, which was eye-opening in a way, because as it turns out, we apparently go back to those things more often than we think and pull out old stuff and you know, somebody's working on a new project and, oh, we did something similar in the past, let's pull that out, okay? But that was about the extent of the damage for our development efforts. Um, some of our general infrastructure, like email, uh, were on Office 365 on Azure. So after some initial hardship, the actual email and things like SharePoint were actually not affected. So that was also good news and allowed us to continue. File storage was a mixture of internal and cloud storage, uh, but most of the cloud storage were things like Dropbox uh, and OneDrive that we use a lot. So that was affected, uh, but the good news is that was similar to GitHub or, or DevOps in Azure in that, yes, everything was encrypted and everything was encrypted and shared very efficiently, but with all those services, you can roll back. So we were simply able, it was a little bit of a work intensive thing, but we were able to roll all that back to the beginning of the attack. And, uh, and then we had our files back. So that turned out not to be a big problem at all. Uh, all our databases, like I said, that were in our own data center, except for some development databases, but everything that was production, we had in our own data centers and therefore it was gone. And dates that were of any importance were also internal. So some external websites existed, but they were kind of secondary. So that meant uh, all our websites pretty much were gone, like I've mentioned before. Okay. And very interesting, other infrastructure that you don't necessarily think of so much was gone as well. Typically, when you think of, you know, what gets attacked, what do I need to back up? Uh, what data should I replicate maybe offsite? You know, those are databases, those are file storage systems, things of that nature. But what you don't think of so much is things like DNS servers, Active Directory servers. How exactly do you back that up efficiently? Uh, and, and how good a job are you doing at that? Uh, we had things like uh, for automated email, we didn't go through Office 365, but uh, you know, if you go into our website and you say, hey, I forgot my password, send me a password reminder or a temporary password, those types of emails went through internal email servers, which of course were all gone at that point. And so we had no idea what was sent, what wasn't sent and so on. Those were the things that were most surprising was these secondary little things that are very, very important for your operations, but that were 
uh, not necessarily at the forefront of our minds when it comes to doing backups. Um, another thing that I find very interesting is a lot of people always say, oh, Windows is such a problem and, you know, I'm using a Mac or I'm using Linux or whatever. Uh, in our case, absolutely everything was affected, uh, whether that was Linux, whether that was Macs, whether that was Android or iOS, things were encrypted everywhere because Medusa does such a good job at reaching out out to network resources. So for instance, we had a relatively large file storage system that was all Linux based. And the, the, the ransomware simply reached out to that uh, system and uh, encrypted every file on that system. It didn't matter that that was Linux. Uh, so even though the ransomware is, is in this case Windows based, it really didn't matter. We had absolutely everything encrypted and everything was affected. So then comes an important question. Uh, you get this ransom note, you realize that there's people that attacked you, you do not know who they are. To this day, we do not know who they are. I found it somewhat surprising that it was really difficult to find out where this thing even came from. With a lot of ransomware, it's been around for a while, and, and this particular ransomware was around, uh, was first detected maybe in September of 2019, not for us, but for other people. Um, very, very little is known about this particular ransomware. And so we didn't even really know who we were dealing with. A lot of ransomware today is actually driven by state actors, in other words, uh, Russia, Iran, North Korea, China, I would not be surprised if the US is in on it, whatever the case might be, I don't really know. But you might be dealing with a state actor. Um, so, so it's kind of a really scary thing in a way. And you realize, wait a minute, we may not be able to get the, get our data back. So, so do you even negotiate with the attackers? Now, I personally, uh, had a very specific opinion about that, but sometimes you may have no choice. In fact, since this happened, we've had several people contact us that were also attacked and we helped them as a, as a consulting service uh, to recover from that attack. And there were several customers, uh, like a large law firm, for instance, that we worked with, and they simply had no choice. They had no backups. They had no way to really recover from this. And so they had to negotiate with the attackers and they had to pay. In that case, uh, where it was a, a sizable law firm, they paid, I think, in the neighborhood of 50,000 US dollars or something like that to get that data back. And that was by far the cheaper way for them to go. And, and then you send them some bitcoins and hopefully you get a key back that worked, which was the case uh, in, in this example. Um, but we didn't do that. Uh, I was very particular, like my immediate reaction was, we're not going to deal with these people. We, we have backups, we thought, um, and we're not going to deal with them. We're not going to deal, deal with criminals. We're certainly not going to deal with somebody like North Korea and pay them some money. And we're going to fight back and we're going to recover uh, on our own. And in the end, we did but it was relatively difficult. Now, as it turned out, almost by accident, we had insurance for something like this. Uh, we actually had insurance that was more for uh, what happens if we lose customers' data. Okay, so we had insurance for that, but it specifically included ransomware. And uh, we immediately contacted our insurance uh, and asked for their guidance. And they even had a, a security company work with us uh, which was one of the organizations we worked with. We had several outside companies assist us in this, including Microsoft. Um, but in this case, the insurance insisted that we did contact them and negotiate. And so I said, okay, we want none of this, but if you want to do this, go ahead and contact them. And so they did. And uh, what happened is they wanted four Bitcoins per recovery key. Now, that was about $30,000 at the time, which in the big picture wasn't that much money compared to the damage we suffered, but it remained somewhat unclear how many recovery keys we even needed because we had a number of servers, of course, uh, affected by this. And it was unclear with the cross encryptions how many different keys there were. So 
$30,000 would have been on the low end, but more realistically, I think it would have been uh, been much, much more than that. Uh, now, we also didn't go this route, aside from the uh, ideological reasons that I didn't want to go that route. But it was highly questionable, we felt, and, and some of the organizations like Microsoft, for instance, uh, we uh, they were nice enough to assist us from the Azure security team. And uh, they looked at it and said, look, you probably will have a very hard time recovering because of that cross encryption problem. So we, there was a, a very good uh, chance that we would have paid a large sum of money to get all the keys we needed and in the end still couldn't really recover our files. Um, so that was a specific worry in, in our case. And of course, depending on what the ransomware is, the question is, do you even get a working recovery key after you send them the money? Now, one could argue that all these guys have an interest in making sure that people think they'll get a real key because if word gets around that this particular ransomware doesn't give you a key, they're not going to make much money. Uh, but certainly that is the question and uh, depending on what ransomware hits you if that case happened, uh, you should do some research first whether that's even likely that you will get that recovery key. Okay, And then like I said, that cross encryption problem and and you have to make up your own mind you know do you do you deal with terrorists essentially um and uh, they might be very large-scale terrorists or criminals and uh, i certainly dislike dealing with them but you may simply not have any choice in the matter so how did we recover uh the good news is we did recover uh but it was stressful and so there's several distinct phases that I remember in hindsight. Uh, so the early days, as I call it, uh, were largely around recovering data from backups. Backups, and I'll tell you about our backup strategy later, but we had good backups. Uh, I would even say exceptional backups, but we had one problem that nobody had foreseen, and that is we had literally no hardware to restore to. Now we had our physical machines, of course, but we immediately talked to the insurance, we immediately talked to the authorities, and they wanted us to preserve for later evidence and investigation all the hard drives that we had, all the machines that we had. So we literally had no machines to restore backups to. And of course, these large server arrays, you don't just walk into a store and buy them. You have to order them. It takes a while to get new ones. So we had no hardware to restore to, and, and we had a sophisticated backup setup that included a backup robot that uh, did one of our backups went to tape, and that's what we needed to restore. Well, so we needed hardware that we could attach that robot to, and that wasn't just some box, and, and that was very difficult. So therefore, our first step was to literally just walk into our store for temporary reasons, buy hardware. So we bought the biggest machines you could buy in a local Best Buy with the biggest hard drives and we bought pretty much everything they had uh, to, to have physical machines to restore to. And then it took some finagling to get the backup robot working with that hardware because those weren't servers, they were just desktop machines. And then once we got that, we started to restore and we then immediately recognized that we had a specific problem and that was corrupt backups. Now this one really hit me out of left field because we had a, a sophisticated backup strategy, especially for SQL Server, but also for other files. But what I wasn't aware of is that SQL Server backups have a tendency to be corrupt. Uh, that happens with encrypted backups. So we had, Rather than just having simple backups, we had encrypted backups because we took them off site and we didn't want somebody else to just restore backups. And so we wanted the extra security. But apparently large encrypted SQL backups have a tendency to be corrupt. So after we got all of this up and running, we started restoring the first backups and they came up corrupt. So that was nerve wracking. But luckily we turned out we had enough backups and we could go back by a day or two and finally found a backup that was not corrupt and we could restore that. And these backups take forever to restore because they're huge. So you start restoring it, you wait six hours and it's corrupt. And you try the next one and the same thing and it's corrupt. 
And then the third or fourth one finally worked and we had backups of, uh, of most of our SQL data at that point. Now, after we got through these first res uh, restore points, we discovered all the nasty little details, like the little things that you didn't necessarily think of as important to back up or not back up as regularly. So we had a really good backup strategy. We had full backups every day. We had incremental backups every 15 minutes. We had duplicates. Some, we always had one set of backup taken off site. We had one set of backups that remained on site. We even backed up to other hard drives, but of course they were all gone. We had to go with the tapes. So we had, good backup strategy, but then there was the little things, uh, the little app that somebody wrote that exported some data for somebody that half the company didn't even know, but it was a convenient little system. And that of course wasn't included in the backup. Um, and so we had lots of things like that. Um, also due to the gradual degradation of the systems as more and more stuff became encrypted, uh, we had several hours worth of data that got created, but wasn't backed up anymore. Now that was a real problem because when you have a magazine and people subscribe to the magazine on an ongoing basis, 24 hours, uh, seven days a week, within a few hours you take a lot of subscriptions and, and that was a problem. We had no backups of a few hours and even that was a real uh, problem because we couldn't fulfill those subscriptions. Now what we did have and this was really lucky is we had an internal system that every time somebody subscribed to the magazine, it sends an email to our subscription department uh, as well as myself and says, hey, such and such just subscribed to the magazine. And those logs we had, so we could later create an import algorithm from those emails that imported this back in. Now this wasn't all the data we needed, but it was enough so we could fulfill our obligations to those people. Uh, and, and that was really, really good that we had that. So these, these secondary logging systems were really, really good. Now, once we had recovery, once we had the backup restored to those local systems, we had to make some really tough decisions. One was, what do we do with our data center? Do we buy all new servers since we couldn't touch the ones we had? Uh, or do we just bite the bullet and go and, and move to the cloud? And we made the decision that we were going to move to move to the cloud. And that worked out well because in the end, it allowed us to come back online the quickest. But it also meant that there was a very tough road ahead with recovering all our internal systems because things like Windows applications that people, that customer service needed, for instance, just weren't going to be easy to move over because they were some of them were really old systems but we decided it was better to have a, a working business that operated and that was customer facing and up and running than to go several months with no business at all because that would have probably meant the end of our business so that was the decision we made but it was a tough decision because we knew the long-term recovery was going to be very hard but at least we were back up and running so what did we do? We moved SQL Server to Azure. That was a problem because we had a lot of data. It took us literally to transfer all that data into SQL over very high bandwidth connections. The next step was to set up SQL Server on Azure, but we could only do so on Azure VMs because we did things in our database, such as having binary fields or text fields in our database that just weren't compatible with a true SQL Azure service. So we first went with VMs, but that was very inefficient and very expensive. So we then subsequently migrated all of that to SQL Azure by changing our data structures and by implication changing everything that accessed these data structures, which was painful because we had many systems that were very old, had grown over 20 years, and it was difficult to figure even out what those systems were. But so we did that, we replaced all field types, and we moved all binary files into Azure Blob Storage, which at the end of the day is so much better, so much more efficient, and so much cheaper. So it was good we did this, it was a very hard way to go, but in the end we came away with a better system, but that was very, very painful. The next step was we also had to move all our services to Azure. 
So all our infrastructure was essentially based on services that were either REST-based or they were all the WCF-based services that had a binary protocol. And those, of course, did not move to, to Azure very easily. However, we got really lucky because we had chosen an internal setup, an internal architecture based on our own product called Code Framework, which is a free product if you're interested in that. So it's not, not, not trying to sell you anything. But what that does is it has a service layer that can host services in different formats without changing the service. So we were able to take 20 year old services that were binary TCP IP based services and within a matter of days change them over to be REST services hosted in .NET Core. And it was amazing how well we were able to, to move to .NET Core at that point. So that was something we could do in a matter of days and now our entire infrastructure is hosted on Azure as REST-based, uh, JSON-based services. So that in itself is probably something I should do a whole session about because that was pretty amazing. And that was a key to us being able to make that move. And then all the websites, that was relatively easy, whether they were full websites, full framework websites or .NET Core sites, some old, some even web form stuff, all moved over to Azure very painlessly. File storage, relatively easy to recover. Uh, we, we had backups that were not corrupt. Uh, and all the cloud storage uh, moved over relatively easily and is now all on, on, on Azure. So how long did this take? Well, backup restoring took probably at least 10 days. Uh, moving data to Azure took days. Uh, at the same time, we're starting to move the services that took about not quite a week. Sites was pretty easy to do. So within about two weeks after the attack, maybe half, uh, we were able to recover our public facing websites uh, and we were back in business. So, so that is kind of the story of that. Um, but at that point, the majority of recovery was still ahead of us because now we had all these internal systems that didn't work anymore. Some internal websites that directly accessed the data, uh, we WinForms apps that needed to be re-engineered quite considerably to work with the new setup uh, and keep that safe. And then there was lots and lots of little things that we just discovered over time. Uh, for instance, we send out newsletters to people when new code magazine content is available. That was running, but as it turned out, the emails didn't get anywhere because the email servers were gone. And so lots and lots of little stuff like this is still up in the air. It's now nine months since the attack. And we are, I would say we're about 95% operational, but we discover new things every day. So it's difficult to even say how operational we really are. Now, the big question that I, of course, ask myself is how how did any of this happen? Like I said, you're not a stupid company that has no virus protection, that has no backups, that, that open stupid emails. And of course, the email attachment angle was something that we thought is very likely, uh, but it turned out not to be the case. As best as we can tell, after some forensic investigation, we had a machine that was relatively isolated, but it was a remote desktop machine that was directly exposed to the internet without needing VPN access. Uh, wasn't really used for anything anymore, but somehow it seems that the ransomware had gotten in over the remote desktop protocol on that port on that machine. And, and from that point on, of course, they, they got you. Okay. Uh, like I said, we immediately dealt with insurance. Um, I can't tell you how well insurance is working out. At this point, uh, it uh, looks like the insurance, surprise, surprise, doesn't want to pay very much. Uh, so I can't really tell you very much of what's going on here because we might even be heading into a legal scenario there to get some of our coverage. Um, so insurance was not very useful. We dealt with the authorities. I thought this was a major crime that would be investigated. Frankly, authorities like the FBI and the US didn't really care very much, uh, which was a surprise to me. So not, not a lot of help coming from that angle. A little more information about Medusa Locker here. Uh, the long story short, it's ransomware. It's not the highest tier of ransomware in terms of uh, being visible, but that's what makes it very, very successful. And I guess, in terms of extracting money from people, these 
guys are very successful. It's very sophisticated in sent to the network. It's very sophisticated in terminating services and terminating antivirus um, machines. To my knowledge, the origin still remains unknown. There's some rumors that I heard that lead me towards thinking North Korea or something like that, but I honestly have no real idea. Um, and there's nothing truly known about this. And like most modern ransomware, they use a very sophisticated encryption algorithm that you're not going to break. There's no keys you can get that will generally decrypt your data. So it's very sophisticated and certainly not something you're going to recover from. So, sorry to interrupt, Marcus. Yep. Uh, I think uh, the time is up. Yeah, we're pretty much done here. Yeah. Thank you very much for the presentation on ransomware. However, there's some questions. Yeah. I will uh, link, uh, you can reply it on YouTube itself or I will uh, just uh, throw your Twitter handle in the YouTube comments. They can get to you directly. Is that Absolutely. Possible? Yeah, my okay. Twitter handle is uh, just at Marcus Egger and uh, I'd be happy to answer any question. And, and yeah, I was pretty much at the end. And so thank you for watching. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. See you. Thank you very much.